Well, welcome everyone to this week's installment of this CMV web series. Um, today we are joined by Daniel Pineda Alvarez, who is the medical director Director for Oncology at Invite, and he's going to talk with us today about the scoring of intragenic CMVs or CMVs that potentially disrupt known haploinsufficient genes. Um, so with that, take it away, Danny. Thank you, Erin. Um, so yeah, um, this is, you know, we're going to be talking about intragenic CMVs primarily. Uh, so bear in mind as we go through this, um, I will be talking exclusively of genes uh, which are known to be haploinsufficient, and I'm going not going to go through the genes that are not known to cause the disease or or are of of uncertain of, of uncertain clinical significance. This is our um, QR code or the URL for for the day. Uh, just a reminder, uh, please, if you have questions, please type it into the QA box. Um, Aaron and others uh, in the committee will be monitoring those. Uh, sometimes they will answer these questions as we go through the talk. Um, otherwise, I'll try to, to go through as many as we can at the end. Uh, and those unanswered questions we can go through March 12th. All right, so as I mentioned uh, when we begin, um, I will be going through genes that are CMVs that are either overlapping a haploinsufficiency gene or are contained within a haploinsufficiency uh, gene. Uh, this is how our, our metric works. So the first question is, um, does the, the variant contain a protein coding gene? Yes. Um, does the variant do, do not contain uh, protein coding uh, or functional elements? Uh, the answer is no. Um, there is complete overlap with uh, haploinsufficient gene. I said no, we're going to focus on those that occur within the gene. So we keep on going. And then um, we get to 2C, where we see if there's overlap with part of the gene. And then we will go through every single of those steps as we go through the stock. And same for duplications. Um, and primarily, I'm going to focus where those points are completely within the gene. So where do we start? Um, so we need, when we go through the analysis of uh, intragenic uh, CMVs, so we need to assess whether the CMV, or, the CMV overlaps a, a gene that has been established to cause disease by haploinsufficiency. And we, we went through that uh, at, the, at the first lectures. Then the other thing what, that we must define is whether the assay that, that we are using to detect the CMV can actually tell if the CMV is completely contained within the gene or if it's encompassing part of the gene and it extends beyond that gene. So it is important to understand what the te technical uh, limitations of that assay uh, may be and what the resolution is and make sure that we can either tell yes, it's within the gene or yes, it, it, it's encompassing part of the gene and it's extended extending beyond. And then, um, as you could see in our supplemental material, uh, determine what type of CMV or intragenic CMV um, we're facing and what the, that impact of, of the CMV is doing to a gene's uh, open reading frame. So we'll be assessing whether um, the, the variant is leading to non-sensitivated decay, if it's creating a truncating protein product, or if it's um, or, or a uh, what we call a non non transmitted decay um, event, or if the variant is an in inframe, and if it's a deletion, if the deleted material is important for the normal uh, physiologic gene uh, gene function. So these are the types of uh, intragenic CMVs. Um, so prim primarily here we have. Uh, Deletions buff. Let me see if I can change my pointer. Okay, so we have deletions here above, and then we have duplications below. And we will go through every single of these examples. So the first two categories that I'm going to go through are those deletions um, that overlap the five prime of the gene. And then we will go through those that 
uh, overlap the three prime end of the gene. Uh, those have different configurations, and then we will tackle those that are within the genes uh, open, open ring frame. And lastly, we'll go through those duplications that occur within uh, the open reading frame of the gene. Okay, so for five prime and three prime end deletions, uh, what we have to prove is whether this deletion would lead to an absence prote protein product or is going to lead to a truncated, truncated uh, protein product. And this is part of the rubric that, that entails. Um, now we'll go to the next uh, to start. Uh, I will start with uh, those CMVs that uh, encompass the five prime end of the gene, including the first coding exon of the gene. And the importance of this is that these deletions uh, may, um, and I'm sorry for, for uh, I don't know what happened with that graph that ATG is supposed to be here. Um, but uh, the point is, this deletion re results on the start, uh, on the loss of the start of uh, the transcriptional start of the gene. Therefore, you would expect that there is an absent, uh, absence of the gene product, and that will lead to a happiness deficiency. And if the gene uh, causes disease due to happiness insufficiency, then to disease. Uh, in our rubric, uh, those are pathogenic variants by default. However, there's uh, some lenient lenience there, uh, depending on what what those variants may do, and and that lenience um, is mainly due to um, some genes that have alternative isoforms or transcripts that may be lacking those uh, exons and have an alternative um, isoform that has a start site downstream of the lesion. And that may be, may be risking the transcription of that deletion and not lead to disease. So that's why we have that range and that lenience there. So I will start with my first example. So here we have a five prime end or N terminus deletion of the uh, MLH1 gene. Um, we know that the MLH1 gene, a happiness efficiency of that gene, causes um, Lynch syndrome. And uh, it can also, in an in, in autosomal recessive uh, manner, which is rare, cause uh, uh, congenital mismatch repair uh, deficiency syndrome. Uh, so this patient is a patient that was diagnosed with colorectal cancer in the 40s, um, had an adenocarcinoma, uh, which showed to have loss of MLH1 and PMS2 in immunohistochemistry. So for those who are not familiar uh, with uh, hereditary cancer and in particular this gene, that uh, immunohistochemistry loss is a signature of um, uh, uh, happiness efficiency of MLH1. And as a family history, uh, this patient had several maternal relatives with uh, cancers uh, within the Lynch syndrome uh, um, spectrum. And this variant was also reported in the li literature in individuals with uh, Lynch uh, syndrome. So let's start with the rubric and see how it works. Okay. So here you have a copy number uh, loss. Um, does it contain uh, protein coding genes? Yes. Um, does it not contain protein co coding genes? We know it does. So we go to the next and continue the evaluation. Is it a deletion of the entire gene? No, it's not a deletion of the entire gene. And then is there a partial overlap with a, a known disease coding gene? And the answer is yes. So we will continue to the next step. And then the next question in 2C is, does it overlap with the five prime end of an established happiness efficiency gene? The answer is yes. And then, is it the five prime UTR only or there's coding sequence involved? And the answer is there is coding sequence involved. And as you can see here, this is uh, the multiple transcripts of MLH1. This is the main transcript here. And as you can see, this deletion actually expands well beyond the alternative uh, start site. So there's a start site somewhere here, here, 
here, here. So that deletion actually leads to uh, loss of the star sites um, of all transcripts and is um, expected to result in an absent uh, protein product. Therefore, it's safe to apply um, a point uh, or an entire point, and that will uh, equate to a pathogenic variant from the three this is causing. All right, this one is more tricky. So these are deletions that encompass only the 5' UTR. Remember, uh, in many genes, the 5' UTRs, uh, 5' UTRs contain um, regulatory elements. Uh, those may uh, be promoters. And loss of those promoters uh, may lead to up insufficiency of those genes. Now, that's not universally known for every single gene. Um, and that's why um, our metric um, says, in general, we don't know if there's a, a, a regulatory element or a promoter in every single UTR of every single gene. And we assign a default score, score of zero. And that would put any of these deletions as a variant of uncertain significance. And there is some range there. Uh, to allow for those genes where we know there are promoters in the 5' UTR or even upstream of the gene. So let's see how it works. So here I have an example. Uh, this is a deletion of promoter 1B, which is a very well known and uh, characterized promoter of the APC gene. Uh, we know uh, the APC gene is known to cause uh, uh, familiar uh, adenomatous polyposis or FAP. And uh, we, from uh, RNA studies and from your studies, we know that deletions of this region lead to reduced expression of the APC gene and therefore haploid insufficiency. Um, this variant in particular, uh, from our uh, deletion of that promoter 1B, which is part of that uh, 5 prime UTR and one of some of the transcripts of uh, APC leads to uh, or have been seen in, in cell uh, unrelated uh, individuals with FAP. In the, and this deletion or deletion of that region have uh, been seen to segregate in at least uh, 11 affected individuals in, in a seven generation family with uh, FAP. So let's see how this works. Okay, so we go through the same exercise. Here it gets trickier. Okay, so question is, is coding sequence involved? No, the answer is no. Okay, so we cannot apply one point. And is the is only a five prime UTR or the promoter involved? The answer is yes. And since this is a well characterized um, uh, promoter, I will upgrade from the default to point uh, forty four five or point forty five. Okay, and then we have to continue moving through the rubric. Um, then I get to evaluation of number of genes. We know this is a single gene, so it doesn't get uh, more points. Um, then I go um, and see if we have seen it in uh, patients who have a, a, a phenotype and if this uh, phenotype is consistent. So with FAP, it is fairly easy if the patient has the right number of polyps and, and make criteria that it's very stringent. Um, so it, it discounts uh, the, the, all the, the colorectal cancers that are not related to FAP. And so I've done that. I have discounted all the, all, all, all the, the heterogeneous cases and I, I um, have only counted those cases that are very likely to have FAP based on number of polyps in, in presentation. And so I have four patients. So I'm going to start counting cases. So I have one, there are four, so it's a, a, can count point three. And then there's published literature that um, have observed uh, or learned segregations. And I can assign uh, up to um, point four five. That will easily get me to a score of one. In that case, that variant, that deletion of that UTR is pathogenic. Moving alone, um, these are deletions of the three prime UTR. Uh, three prime UTRs uh, are not 
very well conserved or not necessarily needed uh, for normal gene function, although it may interfere if they're missing uh, with uh, how the protein may be processed uh, as it's being translated. Um, the default score of this is uh, zero, and those will be classified as default as bearing of uncertain significance. Therefore, if, if you want to score this further, you have to go through the rubric and gather uh, further evidence that the variant may cause uh, disease by showing segregation or presence in uh, cases with a consistent phenotype um, for, the, for the gene. I will continue uh, here with uh, deletions that involve the three prime ends or, or the C terminus of a gene. But now this involved um, the, the last section of the gene. Uh, and this in general don't lead to uh, no systematic decay but they may lead to a truncated protein product. And when the, you have a protein uh, product that is truncated, what you have to prove is what is missing, what, what is missing is, is it important or not for protein function? Um, so in general, um, this uh, variance may be reported between uh, bonds and like pathogenic. Uh, those that have, uh, been involved in key domains or have uh, um, occurred in regions where we know there are other truncating variants and nuisance variants that have been reported as pathogenic in patients with that disease, uh, we can apply uh, more points. So let's go through this rubric. Um, so here I have an example of another MLH1 deletion. So this is a deletion of the last exon or exon 19 of the MLH1 gene. As we uh, said before, MLH1 is known to be associated with Lynch syndrome. So this deletion is not expected to lead to um, with nonsense being a decay or an absence of the protein product, but it would rather result in, a, in an MLH1 protein that is going, is going to be truncated, truncated or missing as a piece. So what happened here is that this MLH1 protein that is truncated um, eliminated, has, uh, is missing the MLH1 uh, and TMS2 dimerization domain. So these, these proteins work as a dimer to be able to repair DNA. And when that dimer is lost, they cannot do that mismatch repair. Um, in, in top of that, there are several uh, disease causing variants, uh, both truncating and nuisance variants reported in the literature uh, throughout that domain. So we know that that domain for sure is important for protein function and that if it's missing, it will result in disease. Um, therefore, I would apply a, a higher score, uh, leaning towards uh, 0.9. Um, and in, the, in, in this case, this, this collision has been uh, observed in at least one deal with uh, MLH1 associated link syndrome with the consistent uh, microsatellite stability that was high in uh, immunohistochemistry, it was specific for um, MLH1 um, happiness efficiency. So, in this case, uh, we can classify that brain as pathogenic because we are adding the top score for that D2 uh, criteria, and on top of that, we have case reports. All right, um, so here's where it gets complicated and I will uh, slow down through as I go through this one because these are the intragenic uh, deletions and duplications that are not always easy to uh, work out. Uh, these are typically detected either by MLPA, um, exon level or ACGH. Um, uh, the new NGS platforms can do single exon uh, deletion and duplication detection. And some uh, genes in, in, uh, in some CMAs or SNP arrays can detect uh, deletions that occur within the, the, the breeding frame of a gene, although that's uh, actually rare. Um, so to analyze this, uh, there was a rubric that was put out by the sequence variant uh, work group uh, from Klingen. 
And what they have done is that they have uh, modified the PVS1 criteria that was published in the sequence uh, variant uh, interpretation guidelines uh, and created a framework uh, to classify uh, deletions and duplications that occur within the, the RIM frame of the gene. And the reference is right there. Uh, I would encourage everyone to read it. It's actually very informative. And we have taken um, that publication and have adapted their framework to our um, semi-quantitative uh, rubric. So where do we start? Uh, so the first thing that we have to, to uh, determine is whether the deletion or duplication will lead to a, a, a frame shift or it will be in frame and whether those will lead to non transmitted decay or uh, or uh, as opposed to a, a a protein that is missing a piece uh, for the inference or a truncated protein product for the intergenic duplications there there was quite a bit of argument and, and there's still quite a bit of argument that for duplications we don't know if the duplications are in tandem and direct and whether there are inserted somewhere else. Uh, there has been actually a few publications in the past years, um, including what one that was done with RNA that actually proved that these intragenic duplications in more of 80% of the cases are in tandem and inside the gene, inserted inside the gene, not inserted somewhere else in the genome. So it is safe to assume that these are are uh, most of these are intended and uh, not inserted some, somewhere else and we will assume them uh, that as we try to classify this uh, to our rubric so and if they are creating an item out of frame uh, uh, insertion that may lead to non transmitted decay depending on where it falls uh, in, in the gene so how do we determine whether a duplication or a deletion is going to cause a frame shift or if it's going to be in frame. So the first thing that you have to do is to determine the intron or exon classes uh, within the, where the, the, the deletion or duplication uh, happens. So you have to look at both sides of the deletion or the duplication. So, and what I mean with intron classes is if you have an exon, right, and you have codons within each exon, and those uh, encode for amino acids, right? If the entire codon is within the boundary of the of the exon, that will have a phase zero intron or exon phase. However, if the last codon of that uh, exon is interrupted by, by the intron, and there are two nucleotides of that codon in the exon, um, in the five prime exon, that will be a phase two. If there, there's one left, and then the other two are the, in the other exon, that will be a phase one exon. So what happens is if there is a deletion or a duplication, so if you have a deletion of, let's say, this exon, and I will have uh, examples later, and the phase is the same, that deletion or duplication will be in frame. But if the phase is different, that will lead to a frame shift. Another way to do it is go into your CSE uh, browser, download the, the coding sequence of the gene and take the coding nucleotides that have been deleted or duplicated and divide it by three. And if that deletion or that fraction is an integer, that's an inframe deletion or duplication. If it's a decimal, it will imply that it's uh, out of frame and it may lead to uh, non transmitted decay. So here I have examples um, of um, inframe CMDs. So as you can see here, you have a phase two intron. So there are two of the nucleotides in the five prime exon, right? And then you have deletion of exon two, right? So you have class two on this side. And then here exon two also has two nucleotides 
at the end of the exon. So that instance two is a class two. So since those two are the same um, class, it would lead to an in-frame deletion. So as you can see here, amino acid, this is another amino acid, and then there's two nucleotides, this gets spliced out, the intron gets spliced out, and then you reconstitute maybe a different amino acid, and then you continue with your normal reading frames. Same with duplication. So let's say that I will insert exon two again. So I look at one side of exon two, it is a class two. The other side of exon two, it is a class two. So if you insert exon two again, you have amino acid normally, right? And then you have another amino acid, then you have a third amino acid, and then you continue normally through your normal reading frame of the gene. So you just have inserted a bulk here. But what about uh, out of frame? So here is another example. So I have exon two. Now exon two is a, on one side, is a class two intron. In the other side, there are two nucleotides here of the codon, and that leads to a class zero uh, intron, right? So if I take this exon out in those two scripting classes, right, what will result is one amino acid, two amino acids. Now here I'm missing the other nucleotide of the of the other uh, amino acid, and this will result in a, in a frame shift and possibly a premature stop and uh, non needed decay. Same with duplications. Here I have a class two, right, X and two. And here I have a class zero. Goes them all here and then encounters the frame shift, which may lead to a truncated uh, protein product or non needed decay later. All right, so now we know how to you tell if a deletion or duplication is in frame or out of frame. So how do we go about classifying them? So let's talk about deletions first. So the, the sequence writing group uh, came up with this very handy uh, chart showing how we should uh, consider them or classify them. And they have this workflow that is very uh, useful. Okay, so let's say that I have a single exon or multiple exon deletion, um, and it disrupts the reading frame, meaning that it that it leads to a frame shift. And that deletion or duplication is rated to lead to a non mediated decay. So you follow the arrows. So that exon is a, in a biologically relevant transcript, uh, and we were saying that we are uh, number one talking about. Uh, have sufficiency genes, and in general, we analyze the biologic, uh, biologically relevant transcript. If that is true, it would get PBS1. Then we go to our rubric and look at PBS1, how much or, or what the weight is, and in that case, it's 0.9. Let's say that there is a an event, and instead of being out of frame, it's in frame. So it will lead to a region that is missing, and we have to prove whether that region is critical for the protein function. If it's critical for the protein function, then we will get BVS strong, and those would get 0.45, which uh, will classify the brain as default, as brain of concern significance, and it has some range depending um, on how. Uh, strong is the evidence that leads to believe that the, the protein uh, that is missing or the part of the gene that is missing is key for its uh, normal function. And then in the opposite side, you have um, loss of function or you have an in-frame deletion and you know there are loss of function variants in that exon in the general population that they don't have disease and or um, that exon is missing for, from other transcripts, and those other transcripts uh, actually have a normal protein function. So those are probably not disease causing. They will get zero points, and those variants will be classified as a variant of concern significance, and then 
ob observing them in unaffected uh, patients, et cetera, will probably push them towards uh, lightly benign. With duplication, so remember that I was uh, saying that it's safe that we think of these to be assume or, or presume a standard. So we would start here, um, where we presume presume them to be in tandem. Um, so let's say that they disrupt the reading frame, uh, they will get a PBS one strong and a default of uh, 0.45 and will be a variant of significance. Um, if there are in frame, they will probably not uh, lead to non transmitted decay and will get zero, zero points or NA. Or if they're proven to be in tandem and the reading frame is disrupted or lead to a frame shift, uh, they'll probably result in non transmitted decay and they can get a PBS1 and or a default uh, classification of lightly pathogenic since we already got 2.9. All right, so some examples. Okay, so here we have a deletion in the BRCA1 gene of a single exon. So if you can see here, um, I am looking at exon 21, which is deleted here, um, exons 22 and exons 20 are normal. So we know that 20 and 20, uh, 22 and 20 are normal. Then I went and looked at the phase of exon 20 and is there are two nucleotides in exon 21, meaning that there's one in exon 20 of that codon and that would lead to a class one intron. Then I looked at that intron on the other side of exon 21 and I see that all three nucleotides of the of the amino acid residue or that codon are within that exon 21, so it will lead to a class zero. And since these two classes of introns are discrepant, it would lead to a, uh, an out of frame deletion and may result in non transmitted decay since it's not the last exon of the gene. So we know how the insufficiency of the BRCA1 gene is associated with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer as well, uh, and male breast cancer. Um, this deletion, uh, once started uh, reading the literature, uh, is a well-known Dutch uh, founder variant uh, and seen to subclassicate in families with uh, HBLC, and there are, are a bunch of publications um, supporting that. So let's go through a metric and see how this works. Okay, so, uh, does it contain a protein coding gene? Yes. Um, then we continue. Um, complete overlap with a haploid insufficiency gene? No, it doesn't encompass the entire gene. Then we continue. Is it involved in either the three prime or the five prime UTR? No, it is within the gene. So we can skip all of this and then we go to 2E and then we have to see where this falls. So yes, it is within 2E, we have to see where this falls into a sequence invariant rubric uh, or a PBS1 rubric. So this is a deletion. It's of a single exon. It may lead, it, it actually is out of frame or leads to a frame shift and may lead to non transmitted decay. The exon is present in all the biologic, uh, biologically relevant transcripts. It gets a PBS1. So it gets PBS1 equivalent to a score of 0.9. And then I can count segregation uh, to get it to um, one additional point, point, uh, one uh, point, and that will get me to pathogenic. Let's go to another example. So here's a duplication. So it's duplication of three exons. So this is exon 17 through 19 of the same gene. Okay, so I look at exon 17, so this is one side of the deletion. That is, again, a class one intron because there are two nucleotides in exon 17. So on exon 16, you have one nucleotide of that codon, so it's a class one. And then you go to the other side, this is exon 19, and exon 19 has all three nucleotides of that codon uh, within that exon, so it is a class zero exon, or sorry, um, intron. So you have, again, discrepant uh, in turn classes. So again, it is predicted to lead to an out-of-frame duplication that will result in non-transmitted decay. 
So in this case, um, the the variant um, similar out of frame duplications has been reported in patients uh, with uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. So let's see how this works in our rubric. So I'm not going to go through the same table, but I'm going to skip that and just move to yes, is out of frame, and let's let's look at how it equates uh, in the sequence variant uh, interpretation uh, work group uh, rubric. Um, so it is presuming tandem. It disrupts the the reading frame of the of the of the gene. It gets a PBS one strong. So it is a a, a 0.45 um, as default. However, since I know there are other uh, duplications that are similar to this one, that also lead to non transmitted decay, and are seen in patients with um, uh, breast and ovarian cancer, I will use the highest end of that uh, range, which is 0.9, and that variant will be classified as like pathogenic. Here's another example. Uh, here in this example, I have a, a deletion of uh, three exons again, or sorry, two exons, exons uh, three and four of the MSH2 gene. So these are the two exons deleted, exon two is normal. This is a fluke. Um, and you can see because the, the distribution is very wide, uh, but it's deletion of these two exons, three and four. So again, if I look at uh, Exon three, there are three nucleotides of that uh, codon that are contained within exon three. That's a class zero exon. And here I look again, three nucleotides of that codon that are contained within that exon four to class zero. Those two classes are the same. Therefore, you would think that that would lead to an interim deletion of exons three and four. So what's the next step? I need to prove that exons three and four are either very important for protein function, or we are observing this uh, variant in multiple patients with Lynch syndrome and or segregating families with Lynch syndrome. Okay, so we got here in from the lesions of exon 3, we know that MSH2 causes Lynch syndrome to turn up insufficiency. This lesion, importantly, uh, disrupts the DNA binding domain uh, that is needed for uh, mismatch repair. Um, and it may be uh, essential for the normal uh, gene, uh, gene function. So again, I take that rubric, go all the way to 2E. Uh, and here I have a single or multi-exon. Here I have multi-exon deletion that preserves the reading frame. And that truncated, truncated uh, uh, part of that, uh, the, the region that is being deleted is actually essential for protein function. So it gets a PVS, PVS1 strong. Uh, it would get by, by default 0.45. But since I know that it's a, a, an important domain, I would use the highest uh, end of the, of the range. And there are additional uh, reports that have, uh, uh, or case reports with a, a specific phenotype that I can use in the 4E session to count additional evidence, and if in this case I have uh, three, I would count uh, 0.1 for each, and it would get me to uh, 0.3. But since it would already get me to uh, pathogenic, I would just count one, and that would get me to a score of one um, for pathogenic. And that, by the way, is a well-known uh, deletion that is pathogenic causes Lynch syndrome in the two. Here I have the opposite uh, example. So. SMART-K4 helps insufficiency is associated with a very specific type of ovarian cancer that is called hypercalcemic type of uh, small cell carcinoma of the ovaries. And in this case, I have a deletion of exon 30. So if you look at both ends of, uh, of deletion of exon 30, there is three nucleotides here. This is a class zero intron and three nucleotides here of the codon, that's a class zero exon. So it's a new frame deletion of that exon. But these are all the other transcripts of that gene. And as you can see, none of the other transcripts have that exon. Okay, so, so it's important to note that. Uh, and we know that few of these transcripts, that these alternative transcripts have actually, uh, have actual normal function. 
So with, what that implies is that that exon may not be important, okay? Um, we also have uh, detected this variant a bunch of times and none of these patients have uh, SCCOTH. So it, it already kind of, uh, uh, not just you, so this is not, this is causing. Okay, so we have a deletion that is in frame, okay? And there, that, that deletion, the exon that is being deleted is absent from uh, um, other transcripts that may be uh, bi biologically relevant, meaning that exon 30 is not in other transcripts that may have a normal function. Therefore, that exon 30 may be dispensable. So you get an, an A or zero. And if you go to that, uh, our rubric, it would get an A equals zero, and you get a uh, score of zero, meaning that the variant would be classified as a variant of functional significance because that exon that is absent may not be relevant for the normal gene function. Uh, and finally, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, three prime or five prime duplications that extend beyond the gene. Those deletions, sorry, those duplications, if you have a duplication, and we know from those studies that we were discussing previously, um, that they usually occur in tandem. So if you take this five prime duplication, and same applies with three prime duplications, and just for illustration here, uh, if you take this five prime end of the gene and insert it right after it, so you have exons one and two, and then those are inserted in tandem. That reading frame of the gene is reconstituted, meaning that this gene that is now being reconstituted can actually ex express normally in, um, and not lead to disease. And in fact, there are examples of this kind of intragenic uh, duplications, I'm sorry, I keep saying deletions, um, that are known to occur in the normal population. And, and as we test more and more patients at the exon level, we have to score more and more of these. There's one uh, in the ATM gene uh, that, I, that I actually have proved that is uh, in tandem uh, via uh, split read analysis uh, that encompasses the end of the gene. And, and those patients do not, the ones that have that with a pathogenic brain in trans do not have a toxic to dysplasia, indicating that it's probably not this is causing. Finally, this is uh, the group that has been working on this. Um, I would like to today acknowledge um, especially Tina Sherry. Tina was a very valuable uh, member of our team who passed uh, away earlier this week. Tina was a friend, colleague, uh, mentor of many, um, and was uh, invaluable for, for the element of this rubric and will be dearly missed. I will pause for a brief moment of silence and then I will uh, try to take questions. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Danny. And yes, thank you to Tina for all the work that she did and she will be very dearly missed. Um, with that, if it's okay with you, Danny, I will go ahead and start asking you questions. Are you ready? Yes. All right, we have several questions coming in just wondering how you determine in frame versus out of frame if your CMV was detected on microarray. Um, where that information may not be precise enough or accurate enough. Yes, so as I said at the beginning, um, if a chromosome microarray uh, has, there, there are types of chromosome microarrays, so some of them are CGA based uh, that can be customized to target uh, uh, many genes at a single level uh, exon, meaning there are multiple probes in every single exon of the genes, and you can uh, know that the neighboring exons uh, of that deletion or duplication or duplication are normal. Um, however, if you have a SNP array, uh, your limiting factor are the SNPs, 
And so you may not have enough resolution to be able to tell whether that deletion or duplication is within the, the gene. And in fact, sometimes you don't even know if, if it's just one SNP within a particular gene, if, it's a, it, if you have enough resolution to prove that it's actually extended beyond that gene, um, or if that SNP alone may, may be just artifactually uh, elevated or decreased indicating a variant that may not be there. Uh, of course, it's always important to um, confirm via an orthogonal method that may actually help you um, verify that, that the, the, the deletion or PMB is, is within, within the, the, gene, the genes are within frame and that the neighboring exons are um, normal and you can use MLPA, QPCR or other methods uh, to do that. And specifically, do you have any comments about like, would you recommend people use the minimum size, the maximum size and average size um, in order to think about this? Not a size in particular, just not, not a size in particular, just making sure that, that you have an offer solution to tell that your neighbor and exons are normal if it's an intergenic CMV, or have an offer solution to know that yes, the breakpoint occurred within the gene, and part of the gene is normal, and part of the gene is deleted or duplicated. So it's not the size, it's the resolution of your, um, of your detection technology. Um, that detects what that you can detect or not. All right, and then next question, how do you know if any three prime deletion is or is not expected to result in nonsense mediated decay? Okay, that's a good question. So in general, um, in general deletions of the three prime ends uh, of a gene that take away the, the the poly a, poly a tail and the, the stop colon result in a premature, not in a, in, in a premature stop, but a truncated protein. It doesn't, it doesn't result in nonsense mediated decay. For nonsense mediated decay, you have to have a, a truncated variant that occurs before the last exon or before the, 50, the last 50 nu uh, nucleotides of the second to last exon. And so if you have a deletion of the last exon or the second to last exon, those are not expected to, to lead to nonsense mediated decay. But a, 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 uh, a truncated uh, protein product, in fact, any deletion that, that takes off the, the poly A tail uh, would, would uh, result in a truncated protein instead of nonsense mediated decay. So there you would have to prove or, or have additional evidence to be able to, to push the strains to, to like pathogenic or pathogenic because they will not result in nonsense mediated decay uh, by straight in. All right, and then we've got a few questions about transcripts and you know, how do you know which is the transcript that you should be paying attention to when you are evaluating these intragenic variants? Um, you know, is it best to use the canonical transcript or should you try to use transcript X or exon level curation? And I will just point out for anyone who hasn't been looking at the Q&A, um, Quinjen does have a few videos on this topic on our YouTube channel. I did include the link to those um, in an answer to a previous question, but if you just go to YouTube, search for ClinGen resource and look through our videos, you'll find them. And then Rodrigo, who actually asked one of these questions, did also reference one of our colleagues' papers, um, De Stefano et al. 2018, called Curating Clinically Relevant Transcripts for the Interpretation of Sequence Variants. So I wanted to mention those resources before I turn it over to you, Danny, for your thoughts. How do you figure out which is the transcript you're interested in when you're looking at these variants? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I would encourage everyone to, to follow that rubric. Uh, the rubric is actually pretty clear on how to curate those, but it's basically gene, gene disease curation uh, on basically curating what's the, the relevant transcript on a gene uh, based on RNA uh, 
um, protein function uh, or, or, or functional studies um, to have uh, actual confidence that, that the transcript that you're analyzing is the one that actually has the, the normal physiologic function of the gene. But and I will also a, add. It's an entire. It's an entire rubric. It's. It, it will be hard to go through it here. Yes. Yes. It's certainly um, an effort. Many people are working on, including um, there is a group called, or the effort is called Maine M A N E, um, and I believe this is a collaboration between NCBI and Ensemble, trying to determine um, relevant transcripts. If you um, Google that, you should be able to find more information, and they also have a track in the UCSC genome browser. Um, and I believe those are also mentioned in those videos that I mentioned if you'd like more information. Uh, okay, next question. Um, somebody asked, can you, so, so what do you do, let me let's try to rephrase this question, if your CMV interrupts two haplon insufficient genes. So say for example, you're doing um, you're hitting categories 2C and 2E, which are uh, if you partially overlap the five prime end of one established haploinsufficient gene and then partially overlap the three prime end of another haploinsufficient gene, for example. Um, do you have thoughts on how to approach that situation, Danny? I would approach it as so three prime to, two, to five prime um, as a loss of both genes, basically. So it's not contemplated directly in our rubric, but I would I would I would approach it as a loss of the two genes. And and I think one of the good examples is MSH six and seven, when you can tell them apart. There's an actual deletion that creates a, a chimeric uh MSH six and seven. Uh, that is not functional. So I would I would approach it that way that it's less functional. Does All that right, next question. Um, I will let that person write back in if that does not make sense to them. Um, the next question says some companies or institutions report only if the deletion or duplication is a certain size, for example, deletions bigger than 100 KB. Looking at the MLH1 deletion you described, it sounds like the size of the deletion or duplication doesn't matter. Uh, is that the case? So the, the, these are two different things. So, so I think what the, the person who asked this, this question was the scope of the test. And so the way that we assigned this rubric was to be uh, test uh, agnostic, meaning we wanted to provide guidance in how to analyze CMVs that were detected through various uh, tests and technologies, right? So if you are analyzing a CMA or a patient who had a CMA results or chromosome microarray, uh, yes, those have very specific and those vary across labs too that they would for instance, would detect would only report deletions that are more than 200 kb and duplications that are more than 500 kb. Just for to give you an example, and of course, most of these genes are not that big, um, and will fall off that. And because if that's it's a CMA, it's a chromosome array. Yes, you won't be able to. We probably won't have this. Or now, if you have a hereditary um, cancer gene panel. Uh, you are, your, your scope of your test is detect all sequence variants in those and exon level deletions and duplications. So there, it would be a duty in the policy of the, of the laboratory and they will provide you with the, the limitations too to detect all of those variants. And, and most of these intragenic ones, uh, and I, I purposefully picked a bunch of cancer genes, because those are tested through gene uh, panel testing. Um, and in those, you, yes, uh, finding the single exon deletions and duplications is key because they, they represent up to 10% of the clinical yield um, uh, or, or, or the diagnostic yield 
10% of the pathogenic variants are uh, CMDs in this genus, for instance. So it all depends on the scope of the test. For panels, CID is very important. For, for CMAs, not quite the scope. Uh, you're looking for bigger events. For exomes, it depends on the lab. Hope that makes sense. Okay. And can you speak a little bit about how you determine if there is an alternate methionine? Yeah, that's that's also part of of gene curation. Uh, in general, uh, there are genes that have alternative um, starts or or have an inframe methionine that have a well documented transcripts that starts further in the gene so you have the longest transcripts we with by convention and I think arbitrarily um, have been assigned as the canonical transcripts for most of the genes and then you have a bunch of isoforms that are shorter and started at a different uh, at a different site start site that often are more C terminus uh, so if you have deletion in the longest transcript in the first section and you have a bunch of other isoforms that are shorter and start further down from where do your deletion ends and you can prove that those transcripts through gene creation are active and, and have normal function um, you, you can say yes that 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 deletion is being rescued downstream um, that's part of, of the gene creation that we should do when when we put this this kind of genes on the on the menu and you see, uh, if if you have, if you look at the uh, uh, at the relation, let me see if I can pull each one. I think. Just give me one second. Let's see if this one. Is. Yes. So MLH one. So you have here the longest transcript, and there are a bunch. If you look at your CSE that have this one has a start here. This one has a start here. This one has a start here. So if I had a deletion of just this, I would be very suspicious if it was an MLH1, which is very well characterized by another gene. Um, I would be very suspicious that the transcription could be started in any of these other uh, transcription sites. And I would go further and try to prove that Yes, this is the only isoform that uh, that works uh, or has the, the the physiologic function that we need. If I cannot prove that, then I would I would tend to not give as many points and go towards um, 0.45 instead. All right, and then last question for today, kind of segueing out of that is just, can you, and I know you, you used several examples throughout the talk, but maybe just one more time. Can you just talk a little bit about how to utilize the different ranges that we have given? Like if a range is between zero and 0 0.45, like when might someone move to the zero end? When might they move towards the 0.45 end? When might they do something in between? Like what kinds of, information are you looking for to make those decisions, if that makes sense? Yes, so I'll give you this example. Um, so this is the example of the five prime UTR uh, deletion. Um, so in general, we don't know what, what happens in the five prime UTRs, and that's why this score, the full score was zero. If we know that there is a promoter there, uh, and that promoter is essential for that gene to express, I would give that deletion a high score of, of a higher score than zero. And since I know in, in, uh, from the example in the APC gene, um, this one, yeah, this one, I know, I know that the, the APC promoter 1B lays right here. So if I have a deletion of this and I know this promoter is essential or 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 the APC gene primarily expresses from this promoter and I have deletion of that, I'm going to assign that deletion the highest end of the range. Now 
if suppose that this is an origin, um, where I have no information if there are promoter if there's a promoter there or not, I would give that deletion zero. Uh, if I had just trying to think of another example, if I had a deletion of another gene where the functional and the RNA data from which you can tell, yes, that promoter is very important, is discrepant. And they have discrepant results between the studies. I would downgrade it uh, from 0.45, and I would I would pick a range uh, somewhere in between zero and, and 0.45. So it, it's it's it in some cases is a bit of clinical judgment. Uh, it's not it's not a a very good answer. <laughs> it is a little bit of clinical judgment. If if I'm sure this is this is very relevant, I would I would go towards the the higher end of the of the spectrum or, or of the range. All right, thank you. We are at the end of our time. Um, thank you to Danny for this great presentation. And we'll meet again next week and talk about case control data with Brad Coe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.